So my name's Sean Ginevan. I work on a team uh, here at Google called uh, Android Enterprise. Uh, our team is responsible for the business-to-business -business success of the Android platform. So if you're an IT organization like an HSBC or a Walmart or a um, SAP, you're often interacting with folks on our team um, who are working with partners that help you deploy those devices, that help you build applications for those devices. Uh, John and myself work with large uh, enterprise ISVs as well, uh, folks like Salesforce, SAP, Manhattan Associates, ServiceNow, folks like that. Um, but we find ourselves being brought into a lot of conversations. It feels like the, right now we're at this interesting transition point where IT is being asked to do more kind of brand things. Um, and as an example, we, I, John and I were in a conversation um, uh, with a large retailer and they said, hey, we really want to go and optimize our consumer experience. And I told them, you know, well, hey, you should probably be thinking about building for the web for a lot of different reasons that we'll talk about today. Um, and then they said, fantastic. And then we'll use that for all of our store associates. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, not so fast. Let's talk about what you want to do for this project, um, what that means for, you know, running mobile devices in the warehouse and figure out which technologies are going to be appropriate for you. And that's, that's what we want to get out of today's presentation. So uh, let's talk a little bit about an overview of, of what we want to get out of today's presentation. Um, what we really are going to talk about is an overview of web technologies as they apply specifically to Android. We'll touch a little bit about other mobile platforms in the market as well. Um, we'll also how to think about talk about how to think about uh, building app experiences. So what are some of the design and development considerations uh, you want to think about when building out um, web experiences specifically for mobile? And we'll talk about some considerations on trade-offs um, as you think about on a project-by-project -project basis, should I be building for the web or building for native? Um, this is not designed to be a deep presentation about building for the web. It's not designed to be a presentation on how to implement service workers, provide code level implementation for PWA or for native. Uh, we're not also going to not cover things like gray areas. There's a lot of initiatives around how do I make apps more discoverable, how do I make them surface and search, things like instant apps on play. We're not going to talk about that as well um, because I only have 50 minutes to get through the content. Thank you for fixing the clicker. So we'll, we'll start kind of to, to um, uh, frame out this morning's presentation with a little bit of a story. Um, how many of you here in the room traveled from outside of San Francisco and needed a hotel in order to be able to attend next? So most of you, about two thirds. Um, so when you went through that experience, the likelihood, and this is data from a, a, a talk McKinsey did back in 2018. Um, they looked at some data around how people in the travel sector were actually looking through their purchase journeys. And what they found was that 63% of those journeys, so from, hey, I'm thinking about traveling to Aruba to actually getting my plane tickets purchased, um, came from a mix of both mobile and cross-device journeys. So what that meant is I likely am on the train, on my phone, going, gosh, it would be really great to go to Aruba. And then maybe I go through and I, I do some research. I pick that, that session up on my desktop. I do a little bit more research. I start to narrow down the hotels. Google doesn't pay me enough, so the five-star hotels get thrown out immediately. And I go back and forth until I eventually go and make a purchasing decision. What they also found was that 31% of those, of those journeys came through search. So it's not that I went directly to travel.com or whatever website you choose, Google Flights as an example, or Google Maps to go buy a hotel. I went and used search to go through and look for things like cheap flights to Aruba, which hotels are best in Aruba. And I used that as a, as a catalyst to starting my purchase journey. 26% of those purchases came from the mobile web. So that meant that somebody in this sort of cross-device journey was going through and finishing that actual purchase on their phone. And this is really important because it means that we really need to be optimizing our experiences for a mix of different devices. We don't necessarily know from the brand perspective which particular modality a person's gonna be using when they actually go and enter, in, uh, enter into my site. And that is also likely true for employee apps 
we're seeing a lot of employees use a mix of mobile devices and laptops to actually get their work done. And so it's really important as we think about what tools are we enabling our employees with that we be enabling for both. Now the web has changed a lot. Web pages used to be super static. They used to load everything at once. And for whatever reason, back in the 90s, I think mainly as developers, we were like, oh my gosh, if I add one more thing, it'll be that much better. Look, there's a blink tag. And I, I figured out how animations work. So let's make things scroll for inexplicable reasons. And sort of overloaded the sites. This is actually an example from Stack Overflow uh, that they did for April Fools. Uh, they actually redesigned the entire site circa 1990. Um, so the good news is that at least on the desktop web, things have changed a lot. We're, we're making sites much more interactive. Um, you can actually now run Windows 2000 in a browser. Um, I don't know why you do that, but it's a really great example of WebAssembly. Um, the challenge is that the mobile web has traditionally been lackluster. A lot of brands, many organizations, use the mobile web as a placeholder, a static placeholder to advertise the mobile app that they've built. And basically, there's a link that says, visit us on the App Store, or visit us on Google Play. Or sometimes, they're not particularly good at this game, so they just say, visit us on the App Store. And it makes, really infuriates us Android users. And the challenge there is that we know these patterns of development and behavior don't work. Um, the Google Plus team, uh, before we wound down Google Plus, actually did an experiment. And they added uh, an advertisement to the Google Plus app um, to plus.google.com. So when you went on your mobile phone to plus.google.com, you saw this ad that's up here on the screen that says, get the app. And what they found in that survey was that 69% of users abandoned the site entirely. They neither went to the mobile website, nor did they actually go through and download the application. Say what you will about Google Plus as a platform, I think this is indicative of a broader user behavior. The activation energy to download an application, particularly as a consumer who's not really attached to your brand, is high. I have to go to play. I have to click install. I have to wait. Then I have to sign up for an account. And if I've never heard of your brand before, why am I going to go through all of that work? And so it's really important, I believe, to be thinking about at least having um, much of my experience optimized for the mobile web. It doesn't necessarily mean abandon your, your mobile application. Spotify has actually gone through this journey where they've said, hey, we want to allow users to discover music. So if anybody has been to uh, Bottle Rock Napa Valley or other music festivals, likely you get custom Spotify playlists that says, you know, it's designed to get you excited about uh, the bands you're going to go see. And it used to be you click that link and it says, hi, go download the Spotify app. And if your answer is, what's Spotify? You probably just abandon that experience entirely. And so they've really seen a high degree of conversion since opening Spotify up to the web of people who are actually finding about, out about the service through these other brand interactions like music festivals, uh, like news articles, and the like. So we know that building for the mobile web is important. So if we're going to build for a built better mobile web, what are some of the things that we're absolutely want to want to consider? One is around making uh, our web experiences engaging. Uh, that starts with UX and really optimizing around the variety of form factors and screens uh, that the web presents. Right? Not everything's a phone. Not everything's a tablet. Foldables are going to make this even more confusing because it'll be both in my pocket. Um, and so we really want to make sure that we're making really dynamic UX experiences. We want to make our sites engaging through things potentially like hardware integrations. We'll talk about hardware in a minute. Um, through push notifications, so being able to go through and re-engage our users that come to our site. Hey, I saw you liked this pair of black slacks. There's a new, uh, they're, you know, they're now 10% off, or we now have them back in stock, which happens to me. Um, and then credentials, being able to go through and actually if a user has saved credentials, being able to reuse those credentials, or even potentially being able to single sign-on uh, through credential stores like Google. Another consideration is making the web installable. So if I, as a user, have visited your brand and I'm really showing a high degree of engagement, how do I get them to come back? Now, one option may be, hey, go download my, my, my mobile app. It really seems like you like me. Another way is just to say, hey, can I, I'm going to add this web experience to your home screen. 
And this experience might not be everything that you want to do for your mobile experience, but you're sort of bringing that user into the experience, transitioning them through, hey, I'm going to add this to the home screen. Maybe with this even more engagement, I keep them there, or maybe I bring them onto my mobile app. And so in addition, for those of you that are enterprise developers, you can take web experiences and surface them through Manage Google Play. Manage Google Play is, a, is a, a version of the Play Store that's available for enterprises who want to distribute internal applications out to their employees. And so you can create basically your own private Play Store that distributes native apps, and now you can distribute web apps as well. We want to make re the sites reliable. Um, for all the talk about 5G, connectivity is not perfect. Um, I read a stat recently that roughly half of all, um, of all connections on the web are still coming from 3G devices or 3G networks. Um, so we really need to be thinking about uh, performance optimization, which I guess falls more in the fast bucket, but also, hey, I'm going from London to Paris and I go through a tunnel. I get back online and I go through a tunnel again. And I go back online, and I'm on a tunnel again. This happened to John and I recently, because we were both in France visiting customers. And uh, I, I was not particularly productive on those websites that didn't know how to optimize for offline. And then finally, um, fast. So we really want to make sure we're optimizing performance. We know that um, low bandwidth, high latency connections are still out there. Um, and we want to make sure that we're optimizing for those. And we'll talk about some of that in a minute. One way to enable these reliable experiences is through service workers. So service, if you think about the old way of doing the web, the old way is I would basically have a server out there somewhere on the internet, my browser would go and pop up, and it would download everything at once. Um, that was fine, but as sites became more complex and more interactive, it became really, really tricky to go through and do everything at once. And so the idea of service workers is that you can build out a client-side proxy in JavaScript and have a little agent on the inside the browser that's separate from the DOM and separate from the main thread that can do work on your behalf. Some of that work are things like notification APIs that we'll talk about in a minute, um, push APIs, which allow you to go and, and, and get push messages to go and do other things, um, background synchronization so you can go through and start to go and paint the page and load additional things um, in the background as the user starts to figure out where they want to go. When we think about the web, though, it, it's great to have a bunch of technical tools at our, at our disposal, but one thing that I often coach people about is you really want to build out your UX to be dynamic. Um, one way to do that is to use a lot of the uh, design patterns that are already in material. Um, you can use things like responsive grids and breakpoints to change the UI as the screen size changes. Um, Twitter, with Twitter Lite, has done an excellent job of this, where as you go and expand the screen, not only am I changing the horizontal width of what's being displayed, but as I go from smartphone to tablet and out to desktop, I'm actually uncovering additional um, functionality and additional content because I now have the additional screen real estate to do so. So you can see on the, on the right-hand side as the browser, um, as the, uh, browser pane goes and expands, uh, I actually go, Twitter actually goes and says, hey, here's who you should follow, here's trends in San Francisco, in addition to the, the Twitter feed for Google Next 19. These um, design patterns are not only relevant for the mobile web. These are also design patterns that are highly relevant for native apps as well. Many of you are aware that Android native apps can run on Chromebooks, um, and certainly uh, Chromebooks, if you're designing for Chromebooks, uh, need to be more responsive, things like window resizing, maximizing, and whatnot. It's not particularly awesome to be in your Chromebook and go, cool, a phone app. And it just looks exactly like a phone app. And uh, you want to be designing for, 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 uh, for both. One final thing about the web is you can also uh, design those apps and run those apps in full screen. So you can actually have your uh, applications, your web applications, run almost as if they were like a native app. Another way to think about the dynamic workflows is through hardware integration. So, so obviously cellular and Wi-Fi, those are going to be your base connectivity mechanisms uh, that are allowing you to go and get content into the browser. Um, but there's a lot of other hardware capabilities that come with building out for PWA. Things like GPS, hey, I want to go through and find what store locations are near me, 
or where something is in the mall. I can pop up my location and provide some interactivity back to the user. Or potentially even things like uh, the camera for object recognition or microphone for, for voice search. You have a lot of these hardware capabilities at your disposal, uh, whether you're building for the web or building for native. John will talk about in a minute that this is not obviously the totality of hardware that's available on Android. And so you'll need to be thinking about the level of hardware interactivity you have when deciding which tool set you want to build for your projects. Um, push notifications are a really great way to actually engage with your users um, and actually get them to re-engage with your website. Um, what, one of the pieces of guidance I give is please don't go as soon as I hit the site and say, hi, I'd like to subscribe you to push notifications. Because one, that's obnoxious. And two, it's not I have not really shown a ton of brand loyalty to you yet. Like you haven't necessarily earned the right to go through and start sending me a bunch of additional notifications. But if I'm as and Lancome has actually done this on their site, shown a high degree of interest on things. I'm actually navigating through the site. I'm I'm um, engaging with a lot of different content. I can go and not only ask for push notification, but more importantly, emphasize what I'm going to get from subscribing to those push notifications. So as an example, I can emphasize, in the case of Lancome, that, hey, uh, let me tell you what some of the best deals are. Let me tell you about new products we're going to bring out for the season, and I'll bring that content to you right away. One of the things about push notifications is in Android, uh, when you subscribe to push notifications, um, Android will wake you up in the background and, and actually surface that push notification. Um, in desktop, uh, the browser actually needs to be open. The browser needs to be resident in memory for those push notifications to work. So there's some, uh, no, the reliability of those push notifications may change depending on whether or not you're designing on desktop versus web. Um, credential management also comes up quite a bit uh, from customers. And um, the good news is that there's really great APIs for the web to handle things like credential management. So uh, you can actually go through and say, hey, uh, surface out to the user. I know you're signing in locally. You're not clicking in sign with Google. You're actually using local account credentials to Acme Inc. Um, do you want to save these credentials? And credential management allows you to save those into the browser. And in cases like Chrome, uh, you can actually save those credentials across uh, devices. So I can hop between my Android device, my Chromebook, um, my Windows desktop. Why I would use that, I don't know. but. Uh, I can go through and have those credentials be stored across across devices, not just across sessions. And you can decide whether or not you want to uh, store the entire set of credentials, so username and password, or just autofill username and have the user type in password. Those decisions are up to you. Um, the next is to, is to create an installable experience. Starbucks has done this uh, with their native, uh, with, sorry, with their native, with their web-based application. Um, for doing things like checking in Starbucks rewards or uh, uh, going through and ordering lattes uh, from the local Starbucks. What the add to home screen prompt allows me to do is do just that, add that PWA experience to my home screen. That allows the web page to install much like a native app um, and with things like an app menu in the app's uh, uh, settings tray in Android. Uh, it adds, obviously, you know, home screen icons and the like. But again, you really want to be triggering this prompt at a meaningful moment for the user. I don't necessarily want to install the Starbucks experience the first time I start, you know, go to Starbucks.com. I might want to install the, install the Starbucks experience when I've successfully ordered something or I'm checking my account or at least I've logged in and saved credentials um, because the likelihood that I'll want to come back to that is much higher. I mentioned Manage Google Play. Um, there's also, uh, uh, you can also surface PWAs for your brand into Google Play itself. So if you're entirely on the web, um, you can actually publish these web experiences um, both for employees as well as for the Consumer Play Store. Um, when you're distributing these applications through Manage Play, uh, you can decide how uh, both who you want these applications to go to um, in your install base, so you can decide, hey, this is a financial workflow app. Don't publish it to the entire company. Only publish it out to the people in finance. Um, and you don't have to be a G Suite customer to do that. Uh, there are tools out there where you can federate Manage Google Play to your existing um, Active Directory or other LDAP data store, uh, so you don't have to go and create G Suite a, a G Suite domain or create Gmail accounts for every user inside of your organization. 
And as you go and create the App Store listings for your users, you can decide how you want that application to render. Do you want it to render like a website? And so show things like the toolbar and the address bar? Do you want it to be more of a minimal uh, experience so users can differentiate when they're in a native app versus when they're in the web? Or do you want to just have it be a full screen experience, um, uh, have it be a full screen experience and feel much more like a native application? Um, you can publish these applications out via a, a few different mechanisms. Uh, certainly, you can publish to the Play Console, uh, but a couple of new mechanisms we've recently introduced are custom publishing APIs, which allow you to basically script a lot of application management to manage Play, um, as well as the Manage Play iframe. So for those of you that have a mobility management system, you can now control Play directly from, from your EMM. Who here has seen this screen before? Now, I love when I go offline because it means I get to go and play the dinosaur game and like figure out uh, you know, what, what I can, whether or not I can beat my high score. And from this animation, I'm not particularly good at it. But the point here is, is that as much as I might love this level of interactivity, it's not necessarily great for your brand experience. It's not going to help me continue to research hotels. It's not going to help me figure out whether or not I want to go purchase something. So as designers and developers, we really want to try and limit um, the amount of uh, offline uh, messages that we give out to the end user, and potentially even have quite a bit of workflow available even while that user is offline. So uh, one thing you can do, uh, and this is both a performance benefit as well as an offline benefit, is cache certain parts of your site locally into the browser. That allows you to go through and allows the user to have some degree of interactivity and continue to browse inside of your web app without necessarily having to be online. More importantly, you can go through, and this is, this is super useful in workflow-based applications. So imagine if you're an airline. I don't need necessarily need to be um, online to go get my boarding pass or to go look up my trip itinerary or know what gate I, I guess I, gates change. But the idea here is, is that I can surface the last known information about my flight uh, without having to necessarily be online. That's super useful for traveling internationally, by the way. Um, but certainly also, you want to allow users to continue to use the site and alert them when they're offline. So pop open, say, hey, you're offline right now. This is an example from Trivago. Um, you're offline right now. I'm going to go and display what I can, and you can reconnect. Um, or maybe you start to go and start a workflow, cache in the background, and resume it when the user comes back online. Um, but And we know that in addition to offline support, performance is absolutely critical. 53, this is a recent study from Accenture and Google looking at um, users in Asia Pacific. 53% of mobile visits were likely to be abandoned if load times were greater than three seconds. 20% of dropping conversions were found for every second that a delay uh, of delay in a mobile website. So in other words, if you don't have really fast sites, people won't actually go through your experience and they won't buy stuff. So we want to go through and make sure that we use caching for speed and reliability, speed up the load time for returning visitors, ensure a consistent, fast experience, and also, again, lay that foundation for offline experience. We also want to use things like lazy loading. And lazy loading allows you to go through and start to render the first parts of the page, but also work in the background to go through and load things that don't necessarily need to be up there and up in front of the user uh, in order for that first piece of interactivity. Um, this is actually an example from Tinder where they were going through and looking at how their site was built. And they found they were loading a lot of images um, from places like Facebook and other places. And the user hadn't logged in yet. So what's the point of reloading all the, uh, preloading all this content if the user hasn't logged in and hasn't created a Tinder account? So you can go through and say, hey, log in or create account and be in the background loading all these images so the user has a fast experience once they've gotten through that first gate. Performance budgets are another way to do this. You can go through and um, set milestones to make sure that technical debt doesn't increase in your site and you don't go and degrade the experience as new features get um, implemented over time. Just some milestones that you might think about. Uh, these are actually from web.dev, and given the Accenture data, I might say three seconds instead of five for time to interactive. Um, you can also look at things like um, the size of the code that you're having, so you can uh, optimize that. Um, but there's, the milestones that you really should be thinking about are first contentful paint, which is basically when 
data starts to be displayed into the browser, and then time to interactive. How quickly are you loading that site to, for, in order for the user to have a meaningful interaction? Be using testing and validation tools. We have things like Light, uh, Lighthouse and Web Page Calculate from Google that can help you go through and optimize. But don't just optimize once. This isn't like the rotisserie oven where you set it and forget it. You actually have to be doing this as you go and re-release the site, or you can uh, end up with performance degradations. I'm going to skip that slide, because that's not a particularly useful slide. Um, so let's talk about this from a case study perspective. Um, PWAs are great. Uh, they clearly offer us a lot of benefit, but what does it look like from an end-to-end -end experience? So this is actually um, the Travago app again, um, just continuing with, the, continuing with our theme of travel. And you can see here, when I go to Travago, I'm coming back as, as, as a user. It says, hey, do you want us to go and add this to the, add this to the home screen so I can add Travago out and come back to it? Uh, I type in San Francisco. I start to get my wildly overpriced hotels here in the city because there's like Next and two other conferences going on right now. Um, and all of a sudden, I've experienced a connectivity disruption, which you can see, uh, you can see actually here in the middle pane. Um, and so you can see, even though I'm uh, sorry, here in the middle pane. Um, so as I go through and I go through that connectivity disruption, I can still go through and browse to the site, look at some amount of data that's been cached in the background, and then when I reach that limit of what's been cached onto the device, uh, I go through and get a notification, hey, you're offline. Uh, do you want to you know, reconnect and continue browsing? Um, and obviously, when I restore the connection, I can go out there and buy my hotel. Travago's also done a really good job of optimizing their web experience for native and mobile. So you can see that I'm getting a very similar look and feel, whether I'm using this on my Android device or whether I'm using this on my Chromebook. Um, so they've, they know and I think they understand this idea of multimodality interaction and the fact that I'm likely going to go to Travago once, look at some stuff, go to Travago again, look at some stuff, and the devices that I do that with are going to vary, so let's make sure there's a consistent experience across them. Um, in, in the Travago case, uh, they've seen a ton, of exam a, a ton of benefit in migrating a lot of their functionality to the web. They've so far launched across uh, 33 languages in 55 countries, but more importantly, they saw a 97% increase in clickouts to hotel offers when they actually went and optimized for the web experience. So rather than telling the user, hey, go download something, go through lots of additional steps in order to get into Travago, they're actually seeing people go through a really elegant flow, and the users are then buying at the end of that purchase. By going offline, they, and while the data set is relatively small in the case study, they still saw a 67% uh, improvement in return visits to the site when there's been connectivity disruption. So because they're providing a really interactive experience, even when the user's offline, the user's willing to come back or persist through the connectivity disruption in order to go through and uh, engage with that brand. So we're, uh, we're set, right? We're all in for the web. Uh, John's actually going to go and uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges we've seen with customers, particularly as they think about enterprise app workflows. And uh, why don't I turn the stage over to you to talk about native? Hello. Hey. Hey, thanks, Sean. So before we get started here, uh, when Sean first asked me to do this talk with him, the first thought in my mind was, this is a horrible idea. Uh, web versus native is almost never goes well. There's always a Twitter war or something that comes up from it. So apologize in advance. Uh, I'm going to be as objective as possible. Uh, you know, a lot of people ask my advice. And again, that's why we're doing this is because people ask us so often, you know, what do we build for? And obviously, the decision to build for mobile or web really depends on what you're doing. And I never just say, oh, just because I work on Android, you know, you should always build for Android or you should always build for native. But, uh, so I would never say that. So just, just want to preamble the, you know, this section of the talk. So with that said, uh, my name is John Markoff. I lead developer relations for Android Enterprise. And you know, as Sean mentioned, you know, the web has a lot of benefits and there's a lot of great things. If you're building uh, native apps, and especially enterprise space, uh, there's a few other things you might want to uh, take into account. So if your app is going to store a lot of information locally, web browsers, especially on mobile, have a lot of you know, more restrictions on how much storage and data you can save offline. Um, Chrome, for example, you can save up to 6% of the free space on the device, whereas something like Safari, you only get 50 megabytes total. So if your app is for workers uh, in a warehouse or uh, delivering packages or something like that where you're not going to have connectivity all the time and you need to download a lot of different things, uh, especially if you're a service provider or you know someone at a cable company fixing 
and you need videos to be able to like understand and like see different situ uh, situations where uh, you you just need to have a lot of space in the device. So if you're downloading videos, you're downloading like a lot of local content for offline. Uh, the web might be a bit challenging there for you, especially if your device is lower powered and doesn't really come with a lot of storage. So if you ha only have like four gigs of free space, you're going to have uh, not too much uh, with even uh, Chrome in this case. So as Sean mentioned, you know the web does give you a lot of uh, availability to hardware, but there's a few things that are different. So for example, uh, NFC and attestation are two really large ones that are missing from the web. You do have the ability to use biometrics so you can authenticate on the web, but if you want to do more hardware-backed uh, key Android key store or uh, crypto, you'll need uh, to have a native app to access those features. And again, this is kind of just an overview of all the different uh, web browsers and the features that they support. So let's talk about native app security. If you store files on the local file system, like who can access them? You know, ideally, only you know your user and the person using the device. But what happens if the device is stolen? What if the device is compromised in some way? How do you ensure that your data is actually stored properly, especially in offline mode? With the web, you don't really have any options of how to change this data because unless you do some sort of like JavaScript crypto, which would would not really be able to take advantage of the, the trusted, execution, trusted execution environment on Android. So <clears throat> for data at rest, so if you want to actually store files and you want to encrypt them on the device, you can use the Android Key Store with a native app to ensure that your keys are never leaked and will never come off the device. Your application cannot even get the key material once it's created. Uh, as of Android Oreo, we added sensitive data protection. What this means is your key, you, as a user, you must be using a phone that's been unlocked. So the key won't be available to the, the application if the device isn't unlocked. And to add to this even more, they, they also support biometric authentication. So when you're creating keys with the Android Key Store, you can actually set flags to say, always require authentication, have a timeout on, on the authentication, and require sensitive data protection. So you could actually have it require a user to be present for any time the key is even accessed, so depending on the level of data that you're uh, working on here. With key attestation, you can also ensure that your keys haven't been compromised and that they've never left the device. What about data in transit? What if I'm sending data? What if I'm calling really sensitive services and I need to make sure that someone hasn't injected a bad certificate? You can use uh, OCSP, which is the Online Certificate Status Protocol, which is built into Android as of NuGet, which is uh, Android 7. And that allows you to add uh, checks to actually ensure that you can talk to your uh, certificate authority and make sure that this certificate is valid and it is what it says it is. Uh, one other thing you can do as well is TLD verification. So that's the top level domains and making sure that someone hasn't created a fake one uh, or someone hasn't tried to compromise a device. Protected confirmation. Uh, we launched the Titan keys on Pixel devices, and we just announced that we're taking that to uh, more devices as of yesterday uh, with cloud and on Android. And protected confirmation allows you to verify that the transaction you're trying to accomplish uh, is being executed by a actual person on the device. So similar to a UB key, if you use one to log in, if you have a corporate laptop, it, it basically makes sure that you are actually present, so someone's not emulating or simulating your application in an, uh, you know, in Android Studio or, or other tools, and it provides the fact that you're there. Because if someone packet sniffs your services, they can try to make calls and replay uh, calls, but with built-in hardware in the device, you can't fake that. Safety net. <clears throat> uh, one other thing that you can't enforce when you're building just a pure web app on mobile is how do I know if my device has been rooted? How, I know, how do I know if I'm actually on a real Android device at all? Because you, know, you can rip APKs from the web. You can rip them off your phone and try to run them. You can deconstruct them and figure out, like, how can I, how can I try to compromise this app? How can I try to replay and run, run this app without doing that? SafetyNet allows you to validate that you are actually on an actual device, and it's a CTS-compliant device. That means that 
uh, Google knows about it, and it's a device that meets the test specifications of what we have. So someone just didn't build a random open source version of Android just to try to compromise and run your app. As an example, here's what SafetyNet looks like after you call it. Uh, I'm not going to jump into the code here, but just as an example, like the two last fields in this JSON signature blob that come back are basic integrity, which means has this device been rooted at all, and CTS profile match, which means that it's actually a device. <clears throat> and in more detail, SafetyNet has a few steps that it takes, and this is to ensure that you actually know that you one you you know that the call is happening you know what user is using uh, is actually calling the service and then ensuring from google that i actually have a real response from safety net so to jump through these really quick the first thing you're going to do is you're going to generate a nonce which is a one-time use token and that should be tied to whatever user is logged in through your application that way and this is something you save and make sure on your back end yourself that you know is only used once, and you know it's tied to the correct person. Uh, in Android, you would call SafetyNet, you call the API to attest that this device has not been rooted and to reach out to Google to say, hey, you know, do you know about this device? Has it been rooted? What's going on here? You're going to get back the JSON web signature that I showed you earlier that has uh, a key, uh, a signature, and all the different fields that you might want to look at, timestamps, APK, you know, is this compromised or not? And you need to send this back to your server and check all these fields to make sure, hey, does this make sense? You know, I just sent this. Does the time make sense? Does the signature make sense? And you reach out to Google to ask one last time, hey, by the way, it, you know, did you, is this a real response? Does the signature match? If yes, that's great. You're fine. If not, then you know that you can disable that user on your back end as well. So that means that you know that this user has been using a compromised device, and you can block them from accessing uh, any any service after that. You know, one other thing as well that you know you have some device management with Chrome and web browsers on mobile, but you have much more control over this with third-party tools like EMMs, which allow you to inject settings into your application. So, if you're building for the web, you would have to build in all the different features. So, if I wanted to have a configurable application where I have different settings based on different user types. Uh, you actually have to build that into your web application. Or what you can do is, if you're using like a commercial EMM, you can inject settings via manage config, which will configure each user's device from an admin console. So you don't actually have to write custom code to handle the different situations, if that makes sense. Uh, Android, not sure if everyone knows, there is a concept of a work profile. So if you're enterprise or company supports bringing your own device to work, you can install a work profile, which is a separate container on the device that allows you to uh, basically separate your work and personal life. It's, it, it maintains privacy. And it actually allows you to now, you can turn it off at night if you want to, to not be getting pings and work emails and everything like that all the time. And then on the corporate side, if your company actually hands you a phone or a device, uh, this device has a lot more features that you, know, you can get pull logs, as deep inspection, um, and it has full admin visibility on everything that's going on on it. So in these kinds of cases, you know, with a lot more enterprises are using, uh, you, they use both, but for some of the really specific uh, use cases we're talking about with especially custom hardware, uh, you'd probably have a, a company-owned device. So here's, here's some information on, we don't have to go through all these things, but if you're building for work profile, your application automatically kind of has to handle a few situations and scenarios. And this is important because you know, it's, it allows you to run your app in a limited privilege container, which it might not necessarily be aware of. So a few things here, not, not really going to go over them in super detail, but um, your app might not act like it usually does. There's going to be features like the camera might not exist. You might not be able to share things. You might not be able to save files like you normally do. And you, and you can't handle notifications in the same way. They work a little bit differently uh, in the work profile. So I mentioned managed configurations earlier. Just to kind of go through what that flow looks like, when you're building an Android application, you're going to define like, how it's configurable. So let's say I'm an email client. Well, you're probably going to have an email address, server, and depending on that server type, you might have port and a bunch of other information. 
So you generate a little XML file which defines, hey, I'm expecting an email address which is a string, I'm exp expecting a port which is an in, and maybe you know, uh, an address which is a string as well. And what that does is uh, Play automatically knows and reads that. So that gets injected into Google Play, which talks to an EMM which says, okay, this app has these settings to configure. So when they're adding from the EMM perspective or your admin is adding a new phone or device, they would be able to set those fields automatically. So you just start your phone up and, oh, look, I know this is John. This is his email address. This is this. So I open the app and it just works already. I don't have to, I don't have to go like, try to figure out what my email settings are, for example. And then, yeah. So that's the native side of things. Uh, we do have more resources. Uh, a couple things I didn't mention from a design perspective, and I mentioned that there's you know, all the different browsers and the challenges there. Obviously, also, there's a lot of different Android devices, a lot of different Android versions. We launched Jetpack two years ago at Google I.O., which is a more holistic support library for Android, and that allows you to more easily handle backwards compatibility. Yeah, so I think that's it. I think we can, I'll pass it back to Sean, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks, John. <coughs> I'm going to steal the clicker back. Yep. Um, so, uh, so hopefully this gives you like a high-level overview of of building for enterprise. I think what we often coach folks on, and John brought this up at the beginning of the presentation, like this is not a religious war. Um, at the end of the day, what you're building for needs to depend on the projects that you're actually building inside of your organization. There are lots of cases where building for the web is a really simple way to get basic workflows into the hands of your users. It's certainly from a brand and a B2C perspective an absolutely critical way uh, to be engaging with your customers, but it's not necessarily the right technology uh, depending on what types of workflows uh, you're building out um, for your enterprise. Um, so as John mentioned, we have a ton of tools uh, out there, whether you're building, trying to understand how to build out enterprise apps, use some of the tools that John had mentioned, um, definitely encourage you to go to those. <laughs>